The following is the account of his success. Diverse of Asher and Manasseh and of Zebulon humbled themselves and came to Jerusalem. Also in Judah the hand of God was to give them one heart to do the commandment of the king and of the princes by the word of the Lord. So there was great joy in Jerusalem, for since the time of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, there was not the like in Jerusalem. Second Chronicles 30, verses 11, 12, and 26. This was the case also at the return from Babylon, when the schism between Judah and Israel was about to be completely cured. They were both cured of their disposition to idolatry. The altar was set upon his bases. The temple was built after the manner thereof, and whatsoever was commanded by the God of heaven, diligently done for the house of God of, of the God of heaven. It was at a period emphatically called the time of Reformation, that the Jew and Greek, barbarian and Scythian, bond and free, were made one after the labors of the greatest of all reformers, as well as peacemakers, and of his forerunner, of whom it was said, Many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Luke 1, verses 16 and 17. Subsequently, there have been times of reformation in the church, and especially in our land, which were accompanied by a happy and uncommon spirit of unanimity and conjunction among the friends of religion, and to those measure, measures excuse me, which once and again put a premature stop to the progress of religious reform in England, and which at one time overturned and afterwards defaced and marred a more perfect reformation attained in Scotland, we must principally attribute those ecclesiastical divisions and feuds which have arisen at different periods and still prevail in both countries. The ways and thoughts of the Almighty are very different from ours. We seek great things. He seeks those which are good. We look on the outward appearance of a cause or a measure. He looks into the heart of it. We despise the day of small things, and nothing will satisfy us but an attempt upon a great scale. He, on the contrary, delights in a work which is in its beginning small, in its progress gradual, noiseless, and often imperceptible but in its latter end doth greatly increase. We would unite large masses and afterwards set about reforming them. His plan is the reverse. Turn, O backsliding children, and I will take you one of a city and two of a family and will bring you to Zion, and I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding, and it shall come to pass when ye be multiplied and increased in the land. They shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord, and all nations shall be gathered unto it to the name of the Lord." Jeremiah 3, verses 14 and 17. Number 5. God sometimes facilitates and prepares the way for union by removing the occasions of offense and division. The righteous judgment he permits stumbling blocks to fall in the way of professors of religion. Excuse me. In righteous judgment he permits stumbling blocks to fall in the way of professors of religion, which he afterwards mercifully removes. As long as the two kingdoms of Judah and Israel subsisted in their rivals, and policy concurred with a passion for idolatry in keeping up their religious dissensions. In overturning the kingdom of Israel by the Assyrians, he whose views were not limited to the accomplishment of a single end, intended not only to punish the people for their defection from his worship, but also to prepare the way for their coalescing with Judah into one holy society. Yet a little while, says he, and I will cause to cease the kingdom of the house of Israel. Then shall the children of Judah and the children of Israel be gathered together, and appoint themselves one head, and they shall come up out of the land. Hosea 1, verses 4 and 11. Even the kingdom of Judah behooved to be dissolved, that every obstruction might be removed out of the way, and that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem might not magnify themselves over their brethren. A long and violent quarrel had subsisted between the Jews and Samaritans, which turned chiefly on the question whether Jerusalem or Mount Gerizim was, divinely, was the divinely appointed place of sacred service. The Jews were in the right on the merits of this question, though they allowed their zeal to carry them to a vicious extreme in not only refusing to symbolize with the corrupt worship, but in also declining to have any civil or friendly dealings with the Samaritans. This was our Savior's judgment. 
and yet he intimated to the woman of Samaria that God was about to put an end to the dispute in a way which neither of the contending parties looked for. Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is, when the true worshippers of the Father shall worship him in spirit and in truth. John 4, verses 21 to 23. It pleased God, who made peace by the blood of the cross, at the same time to reconcile Jews and Gentiles, and to abolish the ceremonial law, which was the wall of partition between them, that they might become one holy family. Through, excuse me, Though the virtual abrogation of this law by the death of Christ set the consciences of Christians free from its observance, their union was not yet complete. The temporary regulations made by divine direction for preserving communion between Jews and Gentiles, though they allayed, did not put an end to all offenses and divisions arising from this quarter. And therefore God provided for the consolidation of the union by destroying the temple, and thus rendering the peculiar service connected with it physically impossible. Instances of the same kind, or at least analogous, might be pointed out in the subsequent history of the church. Dissensions which had arisen among the early Christians during the severe and numerous persecutions which they suffered were terminated by the excuse me, which were terminated on the overthrow of pagan Rome, the law known by the name of the Interim, enacted in Germany soon after the Reformation, was not only the cause of much suffering, but also of violent disputes and great disunion among Protestants. While some of them pleaded the lawfulness of complying with its regulations, and others, more firm and consistent, condemned this with a sinful conformity. On the same kind, excuse me, of the same kind, during the last and sorest persecution on this country were the, disi were the disputes excuse me, among Presbyterians, excited by the various ensnaring oaths and tests imposed by government, and the indulgences and tolerations which flowed from an Erastian supremacy, were clogged with sinful conditions, and intended to pave the way for the establishment of popery and arbitrary power. All these were abolished at the Revolution, I do not mean to say that the simple abolition of these or similar impositions will in itself heal the divisions which they, were, they had occasioned, or that it is a sufficient or proper reason for the immediate restoration of interrupted communion and harmony. As no external circumstance ought to mar the unity and peace of the Church, nor can it have this effect without the intervention of human imperfection and sin, so no change of external circumstances can restore what was lost without the cooperation of the grace of God, inclining the hearts of the parties to their duty and to one another. All that is meant is that this is one of the means which providence is sometimes pleased to employ and bless, and that by removing temptations on the one hand and occasions of offense on the other. It has a tendency to facilitate arrangements for peace in which a regard to faithfulness and the public interests of religion is combined with a due respect to the convictions of brethren and an enlightened consideration of the circumstances in which they may have been placed. I cannot help viewing the present non-imposition of that oath, which at first occasioned a breach in the, in the secession body, as a dis dispensation of this kind, and which admits of being improved in the way just mentioned provided the parties concerned were cordially attached to the common cause espoused by their fathers and at one as to the great ends and objects of their original association god prepares the way for union in his church by causing the divided parties to participate in the same afflictions and deliverances Having described the judgments inflicted on the kingdom of the ten tribes, God says to Judah, Thou shalt drink of thy sister's cup, deep and large. Thou shalt be filled with drunkenness and sorrow with the cup of thy sister, Samaria. Ezekiel 33, uh, excuse me, Ezekiel 23, verse 32. Both the punishment and the deliverance of Israel and Judah are often spoken of by the prophets as one, and as intended equally for their reformation and reunion. By this, therefore, shall the iniquity of Jacob be purged, and this is all the fruit, to take away sin. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall beat along the channel of the river into the stream of Egypt, and ye shall be gathered one by one, O ye children of Israel. Isaiah 27, verses 9 and 12, 
See also Jeremiah 1, verses 17 through 20 and verse 33. And here a footnote. A metaphor borrowed from the practice of hunters who beat the bushes along the banks of rivers to rouse and dislodge the wild beasts which took refuge there.